All right, today uh, I'm going to supplement my reading of Messian's Techniques of My Musical Language with a read-through of this article, which is a, a book review uh, by Peter Asimov. It was published in 2019. I'm about maybe two-thirds of the way through techniques, and I'm starting to form some ideas uh, in summary. If I were to be asked, what are Messian's musical techniques? Th there are some obvious answers about rhythmic, melodic, harmonic progressions, patterns, methods of manipulation that I think clearly are te techniques. But it, it struck me that one of, one of the more interesting technique in the sense of larger compositional approach or mindset philosophy even is this idea of the compositional prism compositional filter which messian refers to in a couple of the chapters of the techniques uh, by way of taking ideas inspiration and then applying what he calls his compositional prism to those ideas now uh, this article is is a review of two books the first of the books uh, Le modèle et l'invention, Messian et la technique de l'empreinte, 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 it's French for borrowing. And they really zero in, the authors of this book, on Messian's practice of taking ideas from other composers, other pieces, analyzing and reviewing them, changing them, metamorphosing them, subjecting them to his compositional prism. And then out on the other side of that prism is his, is his composition. It's really, uh, it's an interesting insight into Messian. And it, it prompts consideration about my own thinking. When I first talked about this a few episodes ago, a few videos ago, I played through a short section of a, of a borrowing of, of my own, because it occurs to me that I'll be, when I'm composing, I often hear uh, a fragmented version of, a, of another piece. In the example that I played a few months ago, it was a Bach prelude, and it's like the, there's a real physical sense of that initial seed, physically, physiologically, transforming. So when I read that in Messian, I was really intrigued. And then when I saw this further review, uh, and not just the review, but the actual book itself, uh, focusing in on that, uh, it, it just reinforced how important I think this was to Messian. Um, so sort of my intuition or my, uh, my sense reading techniques is, is affirmed by this. I haven't read the book. It's in French. And it's one of those horrifically expensive textbooks. But as you will know, if you've been following these videos, I am working on my French. Uh, my pronunciation and accent is not great, as you heard earlier, de l'empreinte, of the borrowing. But um, a goal maybe for the year is to invest in this book and read it. I think it would be a, a good exercise for the old noggin. So again, it's le modèle et l'invention. Um, models and Inventions, Messian et la Technique et la Technique de l'Empreinte, Messian and the Technique of Borrowing, by Eve Balma, Thomas Lacote, and Christopher Brent Murray. The review is from the Journal of the Royal Musical Association, Volume 144, Number 2, published in 2019. I downloaded this from academia.edu. So I thought I'd just read through. The article is quite long because he's talking about two books that both came out in um, in 2017, and um, both seem like extremely interesting books. But I'm going to focus on this first one. So here we go. Uh, Peter Asimov, who's the reviewer, begins with uh, an exposition on the current state of Messian research, which in the last five years has 
I'm taking a quantum leap because um, Yvonne Loriot released upon her death the entirety of Messian's notebooks, journals, um, catalog and recordings, and what have you. And those are now being sorted through in the BNF library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France um, in Paris. So students of Messian and researchers of Messian now have access to an almost daily increasing amount of, of information. On top of which, he then points out that the authors uh, have a very uh, deep claim to understand the music. Uh, on the one side, Yves Balmer and Thomas Lacote are professors of analysis at the Paris Conservatoire, which is uh, the position that Messian held, and in fact, Messian created. Uh, on top of that, Lacote is the organist at the Église de la Sainte Trinité in Paris, which is the position that Messiaen himself occupied for his entire life as a professional organist. And uh, Christopher Brent Murray uh, is a younger collaborator, um, finished his dissertation in 2010. So they are closely attuned to the tradition and the um, the heritage of not just Messian research, but Messian himself. So now here, uh, Asimov, Peter Asimov, describes the book uh, as an attempt to explicate a compositional method that undergirds and unifies Messian's musical language. Uh, this is very ambitious, and uh, they are uh, attempting to do it with a with a very detailed analysis of um, ten or so pieces of pieces of music. Now, the the question that Asimov raises before he begins the review of the book, when you when you talk about Messiaen and when you analyze Messiaen's music. You have to consider, uh, in one way or another, the analysis that Messian himself provided. He defined the terms of the analysis of music with books like the, the Techniques, uh, with a large body of journalism, and then with sort of an increasing complexity of program notes and um, textual references within the music itself. Later in his career, for example, he notated rhythmic structures with um, raga, definitions of ragas. Well, so the point that Asimov begins with here is you can take that as read. You can say that the authorship of the music implies authority. I like that little play on words. It's not mine. Uh, Asimov highlights it. If Messian analyzes his music or suggests an approach in some way, then it behooves us as um, thoughtful analysts to follow that, the authority of the authorship. Um, if I were to follow that approach, I would be out of sync with what Asimov and I guess what most sensible analysts do, which is you take what Messian wrote um, but you push back on it because in many cases it's incomplete. In many cases it can be uh, falsified. It's, it's not complete. It's not true. It's what Messian uh, presented uh, in, his, in his own fashion, in his own model, with an eye on how he would be received. I'm all about that. I'm entirely sympathetic to that. And... Uh, the, uh, the the approach that the book takes, the, uh, the borrowing technique book, is to um, scrutinize the work independently of what Messian himself said. <clears throat> Here's a quote that um, Asimov uses from Alan Fort. Alan Fort, uh, 
very famous musicologist and analyst, describes Messiaen's public personality as flamboyant, protean, and hieratic, which is uh, pretty awesome. Yeah, I just had to look up hieratic. It does actually mean um, of or concerning priests, um, used by priests, concerning priests, and often referred to specifically for ancient Egyptian priests. So if someone were to describe my program notes or these videos where I talk about my music as flamboyant, protean, and hieratic, I would... Uh, I would be thrilled. Protean, as I've just checked, refers to the ability to change frequently or easily, as in it is difficult to comprehend the whole of this protean subject. So I think that might refer to the uh, shifting nuances of Messian's self-interpretation. All right, so what is Messian's borrowing technique? Uh, it's referenced in chapter eight of the technique of my musical language in the melody and melodic contour sections. And so if you remember where we looked at that, where I talked about it, Messian lists a couple of dozen melodic fragments from uh, Ravel, from Debussy, from Boris Godunov, from these sort of fetish pieces. And then he uses them to explain the contours of a good melody. And then he takes them and says, look, you can see how this ascending six in Boris Godunov becomes this ascending six in his quartet for the end of time. And in the meantime, the content of the pitch gesture has gone through the prism of one of the modes, for example. So there's almost like a transposition that takes place. Instead of a major scale, you would drop and replace some of the notes that you have one of his modes. That's the kind of thing that he talks about in his very basic interpretation of the compositional prism. He talks to he talks about it as a distorting uh, distorting prism because I think he's aware that, uh, that, that he's not um, this isn't this isn't um, quotation and it gets into questions of what inf what is an influence. He's very open about it, very transparent about it. Uh, in the same in chapter 14, which talks about harmony, uh, chords like the Peleus chords that I played just before the break, how those chords can be embellished with uh, a partitura and then turned in and then transposed. The, there's a sequence, a process of transposition that's uh, not the same as what we typically mean when we talk about transposition in uh, in our high school or college counterpoint classes. Uh, it's, it's more uh, uh, focused on the, the ordering of the intervals within a, a set coordinate. Uh, and so he refers to this as uh, trouver notre miel, miel, finding our honey, how to extract from these exemplars the music that he's that he's hearing hearing <clears throat> asimov provides another quote where this approach was um, mocked by a contemporary and you can see how messian is a bit of a target right some of this language is very prolix and very purple but here's what bernard gavotti an organist and a critic wrote in 1945 when um, a bunch of critics laid in to Messian, now called Le Casse Messian, the, the case of Messian. Uh, I get the impression that Messian kind of thrived underneath, underneath that. But here's one of the things that Gavotti reacted to when he read that quote about extracting the honey. He said, it's like reading an alchemist's recipe book. He says, I take the first three notes of Boris Godunov. I retrograde them. I turn them into a harmonic progression. I deform it rhythmically by adding 
half unit values. I take inspiration from a harmonic inversion of the third bar of Riflet Don Lo. I unleash it upon a terrifying cascade of chordal appoggiatorias, and I obtain the second theme of my core, Gloria, or one of the governing themes of my regard. One hardly exaggerates, said Gavati. And so, um, so here's the go. So that's that's a criticism, but again, it's a criticism. I would be okay with receiving that criticism. Uh, so here's what Balma, Lacotte, and Murray are doing in their book. They, having framed this all out, Asimov now summarizes. They say that far from exaggerating, this character hardly scratches the surface of an elaborate, systematic, and lifelong process by which Messian generated music from borrowed materials. So, um, not a, not a uh, not a flamboyant protean gesture, but actually a deeply embedded approach, a system, a uh, philosophy, a mindset, a fetish. And then second, uh, how does this actually provide not pastiche but unity? Right, if the the borrowing technique is actually a way that Messian uses to combine, consolidate, and create a new unified style of music. So the book is divided into three sections. First, uh, the approach to borrowing melody, harmony, and rhythm, which is the uh, really the, the prism that's referred to in the in the technique, technique of my musical language. So the bit that first prompted me to think about this. Then they uh, <clears throat> then they uh, take 10 chapters and go through the principal sources, which they describe here as plain chant, Honegger, um, Jolivet, and then musical cultures of India and Peru. So if that's the second section, the third section is this idea of unity, a, a unifying prism rather than a deforming prism. Um, they make a, a, a nice extension of the analogy. If Messian talks about finding honey, they talk about uh, cross-pollination of ideas in the, in, in the borrowing. So in that large 10 chapter section, one of the points that seems to emerge is uh, that discrepancy between how Messian describes his music in his own analysis, and then what this really detailed uh, third party analysis, right? the analysis that the authors do of the same music, how the two don't really line up. Uh, an example that's included here, I'll just read this. Uh, they show how an entire passage from the Turangalila Symphony featuring melodic borrowings from Ravel and Jolivet is structured upon an extended rhythmic passage also borrowed from Jolivet. They highlight the intricacies of Messian's combinatorial process and observe how simultaneous borrowings, not always hermetically independent, interact and inflect with each other. Why then, they ask, remember I'm still quoting here, I am nowhere near this articulate, why then, they ask, does Messian devote his own analysis of this passage to the rhythms in the percussion, which are generated by a quasi-serial procedure that does not even complete its cycle and appears to adorn the passage as an afterthought? Identifying such borrowings conditions us to read Messian's analysis in a paranoid mode. The incompleteness of the quasi-serial cycle must not be accepted as an idiosyncratic anomaly, but rather as a tell, prompting closer scrutiny. The authors gesture further in this direction by referring to passages which, analytically or rhetorically, glint with potential to be rife with borrowings. Does that, does that come across? I think that's, that's a pretty good example there. Uh, Messian would have us focus on one this serial rhythmic 
piece. Um, but it's all, it's a red herring. The actual meat of the music, the heart of the music was this borrowing from Jolivet and Ravel. Do you know Jolivet? I actually um, don't know a, a whole lot. There's some piano music I've been looking at in the last couple of months. There's a set of pieces called Mana that are quite nice. And I just recently got a copy of this called Cosmogony, large prelude. It's really, um, it's a very, very rich, rich music. Um, maybe I'll do a couple of tangents on, on Jolivet once I get a bit closer to the end of the Messian book. So what does it mean? And this is where they get into the third part of the, the book. What does it mean to borrow? What does it mean to be original? Um, Messian's not sampling these composers. And you know what? If he didn't say anything about it, it's unlikely that we would recognize anything. There's no quotes here. These authors can dig through and find this stuff because they've been alerted to the process. Uh, they've got some indication of what to look for. Um, but if they didn't have that, they wouldn't come up with like uh, references to the second Viennese school. You know, um, I know that's a pretty strong assertion. Maybe maybe they would. They are, as, as I noted at the start, they are three musicians who are deeply enmeshed in Messian and in the other musicians of that of that era. But I don't know that that would be. Um, I don't know that that would be something that would occur to anybody to look at if if Messian hadn't mentioned it. And he does mention it in techniques. Uh, techniques of my musical language is one clear approach to transformation. He transforms rhythmic patterns through addition and subtraction, through multiplication, through those those techniques. He transforms melody through augmentation and in, inversion. He comes up with these filters of non-retrogradability and limited transposition, then passes ideas through those, kind of filters them out. Literally, if you pass a, uh, the overtone series through one of his modes, which is an exercise we did last video, uh, you end up with a different structure that then is used as, as a chord, as a real harmonic device. Um, but this idea of fetishizing other pieces of music, I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, as I get older and um, write more as I get older, I'm very aware that, that I'm really responding to not music that I've just heard, but music that I'm remembering from the last 30 years. Snippets from Mahler, I mentioned Bach Preludes. But in no sense am I trying to quote those pieces. It's as if I'm trying to write the context for how I remember that music. On the rare occasions when I actually come up with an idea that is maybe derived from an improvisation of the keyboard. So something that uh, more more clearly composed rather than remembered. I still think that the bulk of the compositional work is creating a context so that when you hear that riff, you're hearing it the same way that, that I am because of the context around it. You know, it reminds me of Luciano Berrio, the symphony, the, the quotation of Mahler. Um, I think that's what Messian is getting at with the idea of a prism. And when these authors talk about, um, when they talk about this as a underlying undergirding approach, it's maybe extensible even beyond what they're talking about. My guess is that this holds true for many, many composers, that we're writing to create an experience that's that's a memory. 
in Messian's case, his experience perhaps is pointing towards the sublime or the spiritual. But in either case, we're looking to create something, that, a sensation or a feeling. And uh, I'm not writing a melody or a rhythm. I'm, I'm writing a context around that melody. Or rhythm. Now, how well I do that uh, is protean. Um, probably good to wrap up there. I'm trying to get back into these um, in, into these videos every week. I'm just going to say every week a little bit of Messian. The the study of Messian is the study of a really um, wonderful body of music. But the study of music in general is the study of the human condition and studying Messian's music is um, a really useful scenario, a really good use case for that. Um, so I feel it's important to, to do this. And uh, if you've listened this far, um, thank you and like, subscribe, do, do all of that stuff. Uh, but every week, something focused on the techniques. Uh, once that's done, I have the first volume of the treatise. I'm going to read through that. Uh, I have a book of his journalism. I might dig into that, see where some of that leads. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please just drop a note. Um, I do get emails from some of you, and it, it just makes my it makes my year uh, because I know there's not a lot of people listening to this, and uh, it's. Uh, it's fun to do, and I think it's useful and important, but it's useful and important to the degree that it's useful and important to, to everyone else. Uh, so have at it, play some Messian, and uh, drop me a note. Cheers. <laughs>